very cool to be cloud. This is my wonderful pen. Is it any better? Mm, not quite there still. Normally, you know, it should be a good clean circle, to be honest. Okay, maybe it was PowerPoint to, or whatever, LibreOffice to blame. Okay, everyone is back. So recording is on or I forgot to start it. Uh, seems to be on. Seems to be on, thank you. Okay, so back to this idea. So we started with the exact from one address space. Let me just quickly catch up, otherwise it will take us forever. We executed exact, exact itself, created a new page table, right? This new page table uh, is the new address space the new instance of this process, right? So it's a different process. Not actually the same process, it's just the new address space, right? The process data structure didn't change. So this is like P1 and this is the memory, maybe it's shell, right? And we're replacing it with something like maybe WC. Uh, it's the same process, right? And what we've done is that look, we said, okay, so first we allocated this memory. We're going like page by page, remember allocating this with this alloc UVM function alloc UVM and then loading the data from disk into this memory with a load UVM, which essentially loaded bits of this L file. And then we said, okay, now we are ready to run, but how do how did we run the process? Do you understand? Do you remember? Can anyone tell me? Let me just quickly switch to chat to, to see if you can provide an answer here. How did we exit into this process? Do you guys remember? Remember the whole game was to essentially say, look, this is the kernel stack. And we did two things. On the user stack, which is here, we created arguments arg for the program. And on this kernel stack, what happened is we essentially created the exit stacks, essentially something what allows us to invoke an IRAP, right? And we were, we were planning to jump through a, a couple of kernel return functions, but then essentially, eventually we would do an IRAP. IRAP would pick up the code segment from this stack. This code segment would point to the global descriptor table and specifically to the entry which contains the stack segment, which has the privilege level three. And this point we will essentially exit. And the IP address, which we also created in the stack will be essentially loaded in the IP register and we would start executing inside the user, right? Do you remember this? Yes, okay. And what was missing is that thing is that we created this process, but it didn't really run. So what happened is that instead, we put this process on the queue of running processes. Essentially, there is a list of processes and that's our today's topic to take a look at how XP6 scheduler works. And later on, at some point, one of these, the scheduler itself pick, will pick up the process and will start running. It will context switch and first starts running in, in the kernel and then eventually will exit into the user space. And then user, user execution will start uh, from the main function inside the, user, inside the user code, right? So, and then since remember, we were created, creating a specific process. So this guy was a tiny assembly trampoline, remember? Uh, essentially, we did it at the very end of this lecture. We said, okay, how is the first process created? So the very first process is not created with an exact, but instead we loaded tiny assembly trampoline here. And this tiny assembly trampoline, what it did, it just executed the exact system call. And do you guys remember which process we were exact into? Do you remember? Shell, not quite, not quite the shell. Let's take a look. In it, exactly in it. Because let me just go back here. And it will take us just two seconds to remind. 
So this is this this is the code which we were executing, right? And this is this init code. And the init code says, okay, I will use this string which is init. This is the label, right? And I will load it as an argument in the for the exec system call, and then I will execute exec. So essentially, we started not the shell, but the init process. So let's take a look at what this pro init process is doing. At a high level, what it does is the following. It sets up the con console device. Remember, we were saying at one point that console is a special uh, file in a file system, which is a device, which has a major and minor number. And then later on, when you open this file, uh, instead of like writing into the file system, we'll be writing, we'll be communicating with the device, right? We will revisit it maybe a little bit later, right? And essentially we open the console, right? With the open system call. And here what happens is that if you say, if open first failed, then we'll create this console because we're running on this instance of the file system for the very first time. And we we'll first create a make node, right? That's the meaning of this make node file descriptor. It creates a new device node, right? Typically, you see those under dev uh, folder on your Linux machine, something like dev sda, uh, dev sda1, or dev console, right? And then you create a console. At this point, it doesn't fail, right? Then you're duplicating this file descriptor zero into one and file descriptor two, standard out and standard input. And then you're just simply running in a for loop, right? So essentially, you say, well, you probably see this on the screen when you boot X with six, you say it says in it starting SH, SH, SH means starting shell, you fork, right? Uh, inside the child, you exec into shell, and this is how you get the very first shell in a system, right? And inside the parent, you say, look, I will be waiting for my child to finish, right? And that's in it. So if you kill shell, the init essentially will get to this line and essentially will create, will, in, will, will continue in this loop because it's an infinite loop here and will create a new shell. That's why it's essentially impossible to exit a shell in X for six, right? Because you exit from one shell, but it immediately creates you a new one and you run in that new shell, right? That's essentially how init works on this system. Uh, on a real operating system, init might work somewhat different, but essentially it's the same kind of gist. So essentially the idea is to create the boot time shell uh, when you sign in, uh, through it in through a login, right? Then you will get a shell. So, and that's, that's it for this. So essentially that's it for the lecture, which explains how to create a new process with the exact system call. And let me stop here for questions. Just if you have any about this subject. And then if not, we're gonna move on and we'll start a new lecture on the context switch. Can you think of another reasonable thing to do other than start a new shell? Uh, do we think of another reason? Another like, is there another reasonable path that you could take? Because if you don't start a new shell, then the system's just kind of dead in the water, right? Right. Or so, you can I guess you can't talk to me. Continue doing other things if you set that up while the shell was running, but it seems like this would be the only sensible option, really. Right. But think of it uh, at this point, it's all in your hands. So if you say that the system shall not accept local logins but can only communicate over the network, you can just create a process which listens on a specific mm -hmm. port and accepts those connections, right? Uh, at this point, you are free to structure the system you, the, the way you want, right? X plus six is very simple. So there is no login, nothing like no user, user credentials. So it just drops into a shell right away. And it kind of, it looks like a meaningful strategy, right? Uh, you might ask a question. So how to shut down X plus six? Well, there is no real way to shut down X plus six. That's why you have to kill uh, QMU, right? But you can come up with a, you can come up with a with a way, and you can say, look, uh, maybe when change these lines, and when when the cell exits, you can just simply halt the system, right? Which might or might not be reasonable for for your scenario, right? Gotcha. But my point was to essentially, and I mean, I don't know how well I did it because it was a split between two lectures, and also. Maybe I lost the line, but the point is that you started in main, right? 
because remember we booted into main, we were super happy about it. And we were running some initialization code. At some point we initialized the, the first user process. We didn't talk about how we enter into the scheduler, which will essentially pick up this process from the queue of available processes, right? But at some point, the scheduler will pick it up. This guy will exec into init, right? Starting init. And init is this thing. This guy will fork. Essentially, init remains itself, but it will, the, the child will exec into shell, right? Turning into shell. And the init essentially will be waiting for the shell to exit, right? Why I'm talking about it. I just wanted to make sure that we understand how the system boots and gets to the common prompt. That's my main point. And I hope that you, you can understand it now as well. And Linux boots in a similar manner. So there's like more back and forth between like during different initialization phases of the system, but conceptually it's the same kind of game. Good. I, uh, I have a question, uh, not like uh, some uh, in the previous one, like so uh, in the interrupts and everything where we are, uh, where we are storing the code segment of the user process, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, in, I was in one of the, in, uh, but I believe code segment of user process and kernel process are kind of mapping the same uh, address space, right? Correct. Uh, why are we doing it if uh, both of them are the same? Hold on, hold on. You lost me a little bit. So uh, let me just clean up some space here. So what you're saying is that the code segment is mapping the entire address space, right? From zero yeah. to four GBs, right? Yeah. And you're asking, why do we even need the code segment? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, kind of like the segmentation right. uh, itself yeah. uh, looks like redundant in most yeah, of the yeah. And Yeah, I agree with you, right? But the only reason we need segments that we can distinguish the code which has privilege level zero and the code which has privilege level three. So essentially uh, these privilege levels are encoded in segments on Intel. Okay. Uh, yeah, but uh, isn't it redundant to have different core segments for kernel and user space because Anyway, that access is being uh, taken care by page pages rather than segments. Right, right, but the hardware needs to understand what is the current privilege level, whether it's three or zero. And the only way to communicate this information to the to hardware is to essentially create two different code segments. And although they look absolutely useless because they start at zero and go to the to the end of the address space, right? So they don't change your addressing in this specific setting, right? So you can you can change it, you can make it different. You can you can change your segment setup, but that that actually makes sense. That's what real operating systems are doing these days, right? But nevertheless, that's the only way to encode the fact that it runs in privilege level zero or privilege or, or privilege privilege level three. Okay, got it. So that's the only reason, and that's the reason I teach you because if I if I wouldn't explain segmentation, I mean, first I explain it from a historical perspective, right? And second, it might be useful for you to understanding various security schemes are which are becoming more and more popular today kind of like uh, isolation within the address space of a process right so it might happen that you see a scheme which is similar to segmentation right but but really it's not just zero and the entire address space but multiple segments right to hide parts of the programs program from other parts right so and then it will be a little bit easier for you to understand those security papers because you know that the segmentation can be changed and you know how the mechanism work. But the real reason is to eliminate this gap. So you really boot on the system and to make it running, you have to set up the segments and now you know you know why we did it, right? And I'm again, I appreciate this question because now I hope it explicit to everyone that, okay, there is no other purpose at this point, despite the fact that we want to encode the privilege level. Good, any other Thank questions? Thank you, got it. Okay, so all good then. So this question, this uh, lecture is over and we're ready to start the next one. And this one is essentially context switch and context switch is an amazing topic. Uh, 
which is maybe one of the most exciting and maybe one of the most uh one of the hardest lectures to understand but it's actually not that hard and i actually i believe that you will be able to pick it up quite fast so let me just quickly do this i was hoping to teach it on 17th let's erase this date just to make sure that we don't have any uh mismatches later libre come on Sounds easy to start a slideshow while it's saving a file. And how long do you think it will take it to save a file? Okay, get you up. Done? No, not done. Yes, are you using a spinning disk? Yeah. No, like I'm using an SSD, so there's there are no spinning disks on this machine. Top of the line hardware. Maybe, maybe not the best software. Maybe I should update a little. Come on. Just we saved one change. We raised 17. It takes us like <laughs> almost a minute. Uh, I was I was using WPS Office on Linux for some time. It felt better than LibreOffice. Yeah. Okay. Context switch. So the topic of today, topic of today is to figure out how we switch from one process to another. Uh, a bit of recap. So right. We all know by now, by now that the threading system switches between one from one process to another, right? So, for example, when the timer interrupt preempts the current process, remember we looked at the source of the timer interrupt and we remember this yield system call, right? Which essentially the kernel involves at the very end, and essentially this yield was the one. So essentially, you were running it, user. The timer interrupt arrives, evicts you into the kernel. You run through the kernel, inside the kernel you say yield, inside the timer interrupt, and somehow magically you will switch to another process at this point, right? And this is the topics of topic of today. So what do you think needs to happen, right? Let's first take a look at, uh, at the timer interrupt. And we already know how we enter the kernel through vector 32. What happens now, next is that you say like there is a switch statement inside the trap function, right? And here you say, if it's a timer, I will acquire a, a tick clock, increment the tick, tick variable, wake up all the processes which are waiting for the next tick. Waking up means that those processes are ready to run. If they were sleeping, saying, okay, I wanna like, I wanna wake, I wanna, I'm sleeping on a timer, I wanna be woken up later on, they will be woken up and we will go through this implementation of uh, sleep and wake up later, like in the next couple of lectures, right? Uh, and now what we're doing is that say, look, this is all good. And if the pro current, the state of the current process is running, and if the interrupt number is the timer interrupt, we're going to yield. That's essentially what I was just explaining right in a second ago. Inside the yield, you acquire yet another p table log. We're going to talk about logs uh, in the next lecture. You set the state of this process to runnable because you say it was running now i'm switching away from this process so it's no longer running but it's runnable because it's not sleeping it's ready to run it will go in the queue of the uh of all processes in the system and this scheduler will eventually pick it up again maybe there are no other processes in the system that it will like essentially switch back to this one right and then you enter this scat function so this scat function it does a little bit of bookkeeping here, but really just does enter this low level, low level assembly function, which is called switch, right? And if I were asking you, write me this switch function, what do you think you're gonna put in there? What would you put in that function? Save the correct context of the program. Save the context of the program and then do what? Uh, load the other program's context and uh... load the context of another program. Okay, this is great. So, what do you mean when you say save the context? What is this context? Uh, the registers. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, the register, the page table uh, address. Uh, Okay, I agree with you. I agree. So let's think just for the sake of illustration, right? Think of the program as a box or context. Uh, and imagine you have P1 and 
at a high level, what the context switch is doing is that we're going to pack everything in this box, kind of saving the context, as you just said. And like imagine P2 was running sometime in the past, right? So it's already packaged in a box. At this point, if we just quickly switch from back one box to another, we can and, and we can start unpacking this state. And eventually we'll like run for a little bit in the in the kernel, and then we'll do irad and essentially exit and we'll start running in user, right? Do you agree with this high level plan? The question is again, what is this context, right? And you kind of you said a little bit, right? But let's take it the process data structure. Again, the state of the process consists of two main parts. So one part is this in-kernel state, which is like effectively everything what is reachable from this proc data structure. So the size of the process is memory, right? Remember when we were creating a process with the exec system call, this guy started at zero and then it was growing. Every time we were extending the error space, allocating additional pages, it was growing, right? The page table directory pointer, so essentially a pointer to the page tables here. I mean, you don't really have to do anything with the page table, right? The pointer is already there on the process data structure. So you don't really have to save it, right, in any, in any possible way. As long as you say, next time I will come back to this process, I will be able to access the same process data structure. I don't really need to do anything with this state. Do you agree with this? It's all just it pointers to other data structures. So point pointer to the parent process, pointer to the trap frame, which is on the kernel stack. Uh, pointer context is a little bit too tricky. Let's just skip it for now. Uh, if we're slipping, that will be a pointer to the channel, stuff like that. But this is already safe, right? This is kind of already in the box, right? You agree with this? And the whole address space of the process, its memory is. In, on this page table. So we don't ha really have to save memory either, right? Agree with this? This is a file descriptor, right? Again, no need to save anything. However, we have to save general registers, right? And the question is, how will we save them? What do you think we're going to do? Keep it in memory. We can keep them in memory or we can push them on a stack, right? Because, I mean, and both techniques are actually equally uh, good x 6 pushes them on a stack. So essentially, uh, remember how the game goes. So we were running in user level. Maybe we were running this infinite loop happily here. We had some stack here at user level. And the timer interrupt arrived and it evicted us into the kernel code, right? So starting from vector, vector 32, we started running on the kernel stack. So essentially here, the hardware pushed these five values here, right? And then we were like saving more registers as we were going through the interrupt paths. So essentially we created something what is called a trap frame here, right? And then we entered the uh, trap uh, function call. And again, maybe the stack was growing a little bit more. And at some point we reach this uh, scat, right? Function, right? And at this point you say, look, I my user level registers are already saved here as part of the trap frame. Agree with this? Because the moment we entered with, in a, with the timer interrupt, we essentially hardware saved instruction pointer and a stack, stack pointer, and we saved all the registers with the push all instruction, right? Somewhere here when we were doing uh, all traps, right? Agree? So now the only thing which is left is the state of this registers, general registers, right? Which were not saved in this period of execution between like be, between all traps and everything like what we were updating as we were moving through the kernel, right? So the sketch function itself will push them also on a stack here, essentially saving them and essentially kind of sealing the box. And you would say that this is essentially the last part of this box. So this kernel stack and everything what we saved on this kernel stack is the context, right? Context of the process and we will keep it on a stack. Do you agree with this plan? Yeah, it sounds, sounds reasonable. Let's take a look at how it works. So 
let's again just review what I just explained, but just at le another level of detail. So we again, we're running, hold on. We were running in the kernel or oh, in the user, right? Then we had the user stack, which is here. And here we don't save anything during the interrupt transition because we don't even trust the user stack, right? And we have the kernel stack, which is originally empty, like when the interrupt transition starts, right? Typically, unless you were already uh, executing a system call inside the kernel, right? At this point, we go through this traditional interrupt transition pass, which we described many times. And what interrupt is doing, it starts saving state on the kernel stack. So, right, the hardware itself saved those five registers stack segment, stack pointer, flags register, code segment, and instruction pointer, right? Remember, we locating the kernel stack by through the TSS, and TSS itself is reachable through GDT, right? And essentially, we're jumping to the vector 32 by looking in the in into the interrupt descriptor table, right? Okay, so we started saving on this kernel stack, then we push zero, the error code, and the vector 32, essentially number 32 on the stack, right? This is the show up over here. So this is your kernel stack. Then you say, okay, good. I will go and push like those segment registers on the stack. We'll use this push all instruction, which push pushes everything else on the stack, right? And then we'll essentially push the pointer to the trap frame on the stack itself following the calling convention because we're calling a C function trap, which takes one pointer, right? This is what we're doing here. And then we call the C trap function, right? And again, we're back to this uh, C code, which we just looked at and we acquire the tick lock and eventually we drop into yield. Yield invokes a couple of other functions, but then drops into scat and skip drop in, drops into switch, right? And this is where we're running. This is the state of the stack. So right when we enter with the interrupt and these five things were saved by the interrupt itself, then it will be all these return addresses, like return to all traps, return address to trap, return address to yield. And then since we call this function, let's just quickly take a look. It takes two arguments, right? A pointer to the context, and the CPU scheduler itself, right? So there's the two arguments. We also push them on a stack. So they're happily sitting here on the stack, right? So this is the pointer to something what is called a context. And this is a pointer to the scheduler context, right? And then we say, look, the return address of the scat function on the stack itself, right? And I'm showing that this is one box, kind of making sure that we understand I mean, box technically includes the process data structure as well. But for now, just forget about it because we kind of already agreed that this process data structure stays on some global list or global array of processes and not going anywhere. Next time the scheduler will fetch it from this global list, everything will be just fine, right? So our box is this stack, right? So essentially we said that this stack is effectively the box and we have to switch from one box to another. At this point, you might start thinking, okay, look, clearly this box is also should be some kind of a stack, right? And you're right. So this is actually the stack of the scheduler, right? And we're switching from the stack of the current process to the stack of the scheduler. And the stack of the scheduler contains all the information to restore the execution of the scheduler function, right? Do you get this intuition, at least at a high level right now? Any questions about it? We'll go and drill down. Uh, can you repeat the uh, scheduler part? The scheduler part is that, remember I said, okay, this stack, we started here with the interrupt, interrupt, hardware interrupt, which dropped us into the kernel. And I kind of drew a box next to it. I'm saying that this stack is kind of the box in which we packed all the state of the process, right? Or almost everything. We're gonna pack general registers, but that's the only thing which is missing. And here I'm saying, if we're gonna switch from one box to another, this is likely also another stack, right? Where would swapping pages to and out of disk be during this phase? First of all, x 6 doesn't support paging at all, right? But at this point, it will probably disable paging because paging, like you, there are two, there are two ways. First you say, look, 
can I page the kernel memory or can I only page the user memory? And at some point you have to stop and you say, look, some parts of the kernel and specifically some parts of the interrupt paths shall not be paged. So right now you're not going to be encounter a page fault, right? But uh, we can talk a little bit more about how to build page faults. So it's kind of a fun exercise. Maybe again, yet another extra predict exercise to extend it with six with a paging, uh, with a demand paging, paging support, right? So we are we don't have much time in this class left, unfortunately. And it's maybe a little bit too hard, but it's still a great extra credit. Extra credit exercise. Dominic, does it help? I will I will I think you're a little bit confused about paging, right? And actually, maybe at some point, maybe next time or later today. Can you ask this question again? I will come back and I'll just spend a couple of minutes on paging just to explain how it works, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page and understand the paging is this is what does what it does, right? Okay, let's go back to scheduling. So, okay, we want to switch from one box to another, right? And I'm saying, so the context is the top of some stack, at least in XV6. You can build it differently, but you can save it. You can save the registers on some kind of data structure. It's okay, but still, this execution stack is still belong to the process to which, from which you're switching from, right? And what we're doing here is we actually provided two pointers to the switch function. One pointer is the pointer to the entry inside the process data structure, which is called proc. And this entry will eventually contain a pointer to this stack, kind of like this, right? We're going to update this entry in a little bit. And this second pointer is the pointer to some top of some other stack, right? Essentially, the stack was growing this way. And I mean, I'm, I'm saying top, but essentially, I don't know. It's, the very like the top is where the most recent value is, right? So, and this stack is a stack of a scheduler, right? So we're switching from one stack to another. Essentially, the only thing which is left unsaved is are the call saved registers. It's not even the caller saved registers because if the caller wants the register, he or she will save it, right? The caller will save it, right? However, the call registers are not saved, right? Do you understand this idea? So what we're doing is we're going to save them on this stack inside the switch function. The switch function is implemented in assembly. It says, okay, I will push all the coli save registers. There are only four of them, right? I will push them on a stack. And this layout matches the layout of the context data structure. The context data structure has, has five fields. Why do you think we don't have to save EAP or? Why are we only pushing four registers, not five? Call will push, call will push it. Yeah, when we call the function, call to switch, we already push the return address, right? It's already on a stack. And look, it's at the very top of the stack. So when we push EBP here, it becomes the next field in this data structure, right? So because stack will be growing towards the start of the error space. So in the end, EDI is the most, it's the last thing you're gonna push on the stack, right? So this uh, layout of this context data structure matches the layout of the stack. So essentially you push the registers in the same, very same order, right? At this point, you say, look, I saved everything. At this point, everything is saved in that box, right? And that box is essentially the stack, the kernel stack, on the of the process which got preempted with an interrupt, right? Okay, now we have the second context, right? So effectively, the context is always saved on the top of some stack. So this is some kind of a stack here, right? Which is growing this way, and this context function. This is like saved by the call of the switch function, right? And those four registers are pushed. Explicitly, explicitly by the switch function, right? Okay, we got the point. Context is always the top of some stack, right? Let's take a look at how now our data structures will look. Our goal is remember, this was the argument to the switch function. 
Our goal, this is the argument, our goal is to take this address and essentially update it to make sure that we remember the context of this process. Remember, the context is the top of the stack. Right now, we know where the top, top of the stack is. It's pointed by the ESP register, agree? So next time, if we have the proc data structure and we say proc context, we'll get this, this pointer, right? So our goal is to create this purple link right now, right? We don't have it yet. So what we have to do is we have to essentially move the ESP into this memory location. And this is exactly what the code is doing. So it takes ESP and moves in the memory location pointed by the EX register. So what's inside the EX register? It's one of the arguments here, right? So it's a pointer to a pointer to the old context, right? We passed it on a stack. Here we move it from the stack into the register EX. And here we're essentially loading the value of ESP into the memory pointed by the EX. Is that clear? So effectively, we're updating this proc context field, right? Remember, I said that inside the process data structure, context is a little bit unusual. So I wanted to explain it later. Do you guys understand what the context, context is right now? Okay, so do you understand now that next time, if this is part of your process data structure and it's in some kind of a list, right? Next time you pick it up from this list, you have everything to start running this process again. You have the context. The context will point to the very top of the kernel stack, right? And if you say, look, I will enter the switch function and pass this top of the stack as an argument, the switch function will happily switch to this stack and will start running and it will eventually do the IRAT and will exit into user level where we came from sometime later in time of the system. Do you agree with this? Okay, what else do we need to do here? So right now, what we've done is that we created this pink pointer, right? Our next thing is switch from the old context to the new context. Our new context is passed as an argument here. It says context of the scheduler. It points to the very top of some other stack, right? What we are going to do is that we essentially load this value in the ESP register, right? Because ESP is top of the, like, should point to the top of the stack. And then we can start popping values. So essentially, we will, if we will pop four times, we will restore quality save registers. If we return, we'll restore the EAP instruction pointer, right? Agree with this? So let's see how the code is doing this. The code essentially says, I will load the EDX register into the ESP. What's inside EDX? It's something, the argument, which we passed as an argument to this function, which was passed on the stack, right? Again, that's why it's important to know calling conventions, right? So arguments are on the stack on 32-bit machines, right? So it this the pointer to the new context, right? So what, this is what we exactly doing, right? Okay, so hold on. So this is this pink pointer, which I have here. So essentially we updated the ESP register. Do you, did you see how the flow was? ESP was pointing right here and we updated it to point to the, to here, to the new stack, right? So this is P1 and this is, I, would, I wanted to say P2, but it's not really P2, it's just the scheduler. And the scheduler is not really a process. It's a context of execution, which we left in a kernel. And I will in a second explain how this context was created, right? But for now, at least, uh, are, you guys, are you guys clear on this? Okay, good. Okay. No. Let me just quickly see what's going on. Hey, what's up? Yeah, are you good? They're going to pick you up. Don't worry. Just wait for a little bit. I don't know. I'm teaching a class. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I just was thinking that it's some kind of an emergency. Oh, I just wait for them. Okay. Sorry, guys. It's just my, my kid went swimming, and I was worried that something happened to, to him. But okay, he's fine. Sorry about it. 
Okay, so we're moving forward. So we save this, the, the, the pointer to the old stack, P1, and switch to the new stack, right? And now this, this switch function will start popping up those arguments. So essentially restore from this new context, which we had over here, right? Remember, this is a context, right? We pop up those four values, right? Restoring the registers. Then we're returning, picking up the return value, what, which was saved here. So essentially, if someone was like called the switch function earlier, we will return to that point, right? And essentially continue execution there. So where do you think the switch returns? Where does this return address lead us? Do you, do you have an idea? To the scheduler, exactly, right? So what is the scheduler? Let's take a look at how we initialized each CPU, right? Remember, we started running in the main function. We initialized kernel memory allocator, created the kernel page table. So this is the page table, remember, the very, very first one which we created, right? Initialized everything here, like segmentation, interrupts, everything. And by the very end of this function, we enter the function which is called mpmain. It finishes the setup, the setup of the CPU. And at the very end of the MP main, we entered the scheduler. So essentially, remember, make a connection. You boot it into this main on the CPU. Like, remember, the bootloader started us. We started in main. We created a kernel stack. We created the page table. This is the thread of execution, which was very the very first thread of execution, which was running on the machine. And this thread of execution enters MP main and it enters the scheduler. And inside the scheduler, essentially, like every CPU in the system, and I didn't explain how we start other CPUs, every CPU in the system essentially ends, ends up running inside the scheduler, inside the scheduler function, right? Let's take a look at this function. It runs an infinite loop. What it does inside on every iteration of a loop, it says, okay, I will take a look at the process table. I will be essentially moving. So what is the process table? It's just an array. Each entry in this array is the process data structure. And it says, okay, if the state of the process is not runnable, I'll go to the next process. I will choose the next process. The scheduling policy is called round robin. So you essentially give every process a turn to run on the CPU, right? If it's not ready, you skip it and we'll come back later. It's not the best policy to enforce fairness, right? So maybe the process just missed a turn because it was slipping just for a tiny, tiny millisecond, but it's good enough to start, right? And however, if the process is runnable, you say, look, I will update the process data structure, right? I will switch user, I will switch the address space from the old process to the new process. And you have to essentially like, this, this deserves like a second look and we'll take a look at this function a little bit later. You'll set the state of this process to running to make sure that you understand later that this process is currently running. And then you invoke the switch function. So effectively you started on the CPU, you picked up some process from the queue and you switch into this process, right? And naturally, later on, when this process will be preempted with an interrupt, this return, which we just were discussing, will switch us back right here on this very next line of this loop. Do you understand this? We switch back to the kernel address space. Why is that? Because maybe we will destroy the user space, right? Maybe this process is, is being destroyed or exited, and we don't want to run on the page table, which will be deallocated from underneath us, right? And again, the proc is currently zero and we'll go to the very next iteration of the loop, right? Essentially, okay, from here, we actually go to the very next iteration of the loop, continue through this table. Eventually we go to the end of the table and we'll like essentially exit the innermost loop and continue running this infinite outermost loop, right? Essentially iterating over the, through the, through the process table again. Is this, is this logic clear to you? Okay, so we got the point that like this return, which I was talking about, returns us exactly here, right? So you started on a CPU, 
this is like you booted on this CPU, you switched with a switch function to a process in a kernel. This process was doing something in a kernel, then did an IRAD, right? Then ran into in user space, right? And a timer interrupt happened. It essentially was like forced back into the kernel, continued into the kernel, switched back into the scheduler, right? The scheduler right, ran those instructions here, picked another process, and again switched. So this was a switch function back into the scheduler. Here you switch, sorry, switch into yet another process, which again exits with an IRAD to user level, runs at user level, then again get preempted with a timer interrupt. This is how the whole system is running, right? And it's important to understand that, okay, uh, each CPU has its own scheduler, right? It's a per CPU data structure, right? Remember the CPUs are on some global array. Every time we access an element of this array, we look up an ID, right? Uh, and essentially the kernel stack, when we started, remember we created this kernel stack page. We first called the main function. Maybe we called some other functions, right? It's, oh no, we didn't call anything. So we called in return, then we called MP main. That's essentially the stack of the scheduler, right? And essentially, when the scheduler switched for the first time, this is what it did. It says, okay, I will provide a pointer to the context of the scheduler, and this I will switch, this is from, and this is to. So essentially, I will be switching from the scheduler to the very first process, right? And then you were running in this process, right? And essentially, this is how the invocation of the switch function looked for the very first time when essentially this pointer, which we have to update, right, was pointing to the context of the scheduler, right? So our switch function will push those coolly save general registers, and then we will update this pointer, right? ESP will be originally pointing here. And then since we pause this argument here, right, ESP will essentially switch to point to the top of this stack, which is like process one, right? And this is essentially those pre-init. So this is the shell code, which essentially forks or exacts into the init process. But it works similarly for all other processes in the system, right? So you essentially, on X with six, the context switch is a little bit contrived. So essentially it switches from a scheduler into the process, then back from a process into the scheduler, scheduler picks another process and switches into that process, right? Got it? Uh, so as I was saying, so which process is this context? So it's the context for the first of the first processor scheduler decides to run. The very first process which we created in the system was just one process. This is the shell code, which essentially executes into exacts into init, right? And then it turns into init, init then forks, mm -hmm. creating a second process. Then the two processes are running, one is shell, one is init, right? And shell can fork and create additional processes, right? Okay, let's take a look. So how uh, did we, in yeah, go ahead. Professor, I had a doubt. So you said we have multiple CPUs and each CPU has their own scheduler, right? Correct, yeah. And they are updating the state of a process to be runnable. They need right. to be some sort of locking as we will right, have it. Right, there is a locking. So um, if you're very, very careful, can, yeah. I didn't want to emphasize locking right now because we didn't yet cover synchronization. But if you carefully look at the scheduler function here, it acquires a lock. Uh, it actually, <laughs> it's different. So you acquire a lock on the process data structure even before you enter the switch function. So we saw it uh, somewhere over here. Let me just scroll back a little bit. It's quite a bit, a couple of slides. That go yeah, it's, a, it's all right. I just wanted to ask, there are locks, yeah. yeah there are, they are locks, right. And you can design it differently, right? So you can make sure that the scheduler uses a per CPU queue of processes. And then once in a while, you just rebalance processes and just uh, move them from one queue to another. This is what probably Linux is doing. But x 6 is just much more naive. So it does, I'm just scrolling backwards a little bit to just make sure that we have, I, I wanted to show you this log, right? But uh, maybe I was a little bit optimistic. <clears throat> 
um, just maybe two more slides because it took me like a minute to scroll backwards, right? And just how fast open office is growing. I'm actually pressing buttons, but yeah, so this one. Look, even before enter the SCAD function, you acquire the ptable log and you will release the ptable log when you will come out of this SCAD function, right? When every pass on which you call this SCAD function, you will first acquire the ptable log and you will possibly release it in another process, right? Because uh, that's how it works because you, you might context switch, right? But on every pass, this ptable log is guarded by, uh, essentially was a, is acquired. Got it. Thank you. Okay, let me just move backward forward. Back to our slide. Okay, so we got the point. So the very first con the very first context switch was done from this MP main function, which was running, which entered the sched scheduler. It was from the scheduler to the very first process, right? And okay, so we know how we know how the world looks like, right? And so we know where the switch returns. It returns into the scheduler, right? I was asking this question just a second ago. Okay, so just to recap, so how we created this very first process. Remember that when we allocating a new process. This process is kind of, we create a context of execution, right? Which effectively says, okay, look, uh, the context of this current process is pointing to the very top of this, of the process stack. And, of the, and the very top of this stack is essentially the context. It's kind of recursive, right? But what I meant to say is that the kernel stack of each process will contain those five fields, right? the return address and four general registers, right? And then the proc context field will be pointing exactly here, right? And this is the kernel stack. And it's just one organization, but it kind of makes sense. Okay, so far so good. So essentially when we context switch from the scheduler to the very first process for the very first time, we establish those two pointers. So this now points to the, because you say, well, this is my scheduler on this CPU. This is my per CPU variable, per CPU data structure, right? Which, which, called is, C, which is called CPU. It has a scheduler field. And it's essentially when we, when we context switch into a process, it maintains this very first kernel stack, which we created on this CPU, right? And we're going to switch back to this context when we're going to be switching back from this process back into the scheduler, right? But essentially, this is what we're doing here. In a very, we use the same switch function, so the same logic. It's just that we're switching now from the scheduler into the process, right? And so the, 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 the way the operating system is running is following, right? The context is the top of some stack. Initially, it was the stack of the MP enter function, right? Which was got called from main, right? And remember, we created a separate stack, right? On each CPU, we'll create a separate stack for the scheduler, right? Because scheduler calls and returns from functions, right? Pushes values on the stack, right? So it needs a stack, right? So uh, on this stack, the scheduler is running, right? And then the scheduler switch to the first process and the first process switches back to the scheduler. Scheduler picks up the next process switches to that next process, right? So it's always scheduler process from process back to a scheduler, from scheduler looks at the queue of processes, picks it up and switches to it, right? So it's kind of like a two context switches in X with six. Uh, it's possible to do with one, but again, the logic, it would be a little slightly more complicated to pass and X with six designers decided to simplify the code to make sure that, okay, uh, it's easier to understand. Okay, so now we're back to the context switch. So we now know that we return to the scheduler, right? Essentially, when we were switching from a process, we returned into the scheduler, right? And after all, just remember that we started with a timer interrupt, entered the kernel, entered the schedule function, 
enter the switch function. And the switch function is essentially where we are switching from the process into the scheduler, right? So we returned a Twitch line, line 2479, right here. And essentially, I already explained the scheduler loop. So essentially, you reach this point, go to the next iteration, you increment P++, look at the entry in the process table, right? This is where your P is, right? You started from the beginning of this array and you pick the next process, which is runnable. If there are no runnable process, you will go through the entire table, we'll go into the next iteration of a loop, we'll go through the table and again, we'll land on the same process. So essentially the same process might be the very one, very one process in the system. We switch from that process into the scheduler and back from the scheduler into the same process. But if there are other processes which are ready to run, you will switch to something else, right? And this default policy is called round robin. Essentially, every process will have a chance to run, you know, like taking turns on the CPU, right? Did you, get, did you guys understand what just happened? This is essentially, this is the essence of the context switch. I believe that it's very important to kind of have it in your head to be able to reason about what happens in the system when the timer interrupt arrives, how you switch into the scheduler, how this scheduler picks up the next process and switches into it, right? Let me stop here for questions. Everyone is clear? Okay. When this, the question is like, what does the stack look when this scheduler invokes the switch function? So effectively when we, we pick the next process and you're again trying to execute this switch function. You're passing two arguments here, right? One, this is the two field. So you're switching into this process. Remember this context is the top of some stack. And this is where you wanna save the current context, right? Because you say, look, I will, right now I am the scheduler. I will provide the pointer to this field. I will sell, save additional registers, kind of packing the box here, right? Packing this box and I will update this field to point to the very top of this stack. Is it clear? I mean, I'm, I'm repeating the same stuff multiple times just to make sure that you know your understanding of what's going on matches the reality here. I hope that it will eventually, right? Okay. And the second argument. So we have two arguments, one points here. And where does this one point? Can you tell me? New process, or more specifically, it's a stack. It's a stack, and it's not the user stack. It's a kernel stack. It's a kernel stack of the new process. Exactly, right? And essentially, what, this is what we're doing. So we're using the same switch function. And the kernel stack of this new process will look something like that. So there will be some save state, save state saved by the interrupt handler, some saved by vector 32 or some other, like maybe it was vector 64, it was, if it was a syscall, all traps save those registers. This is what was saved by the trap function. This is what was saved by the yield. This is what was saved by the scat function. And this is the context data structure, which is, which is the top of that stack. So essentially stuff which I was showing here on the previous slide, right? It's exactly this stack, right? So it grows up from here, right? I'm just showing it again. Okay, so we got the point. So the context is always on the top of some stack, right? And we switch between them. Essentially we pack something and switch, right? So here we again, uh, this is how we invoke the switch from inside the scheduler. So we pass the pointer to the, uh, per CPU data structure where we save the current context and we pass the second argument, which is the pointer to the top of the stack of the process we're switching into, right? Okay, so again, the switch function itself, remember what it does, it establishes this pointer, right? And the second thing which it will do, it will just essentially reload the ESP pointer to point to this stack. And then we will start returning on this stack. So you will pop these four arguments, 
for registers for fully saved for fully saved registers, then you will return returning into this uh, into the execution context, which called this cat function. Right? Agree with this? And eventually, if you continue returning on this stack, what will happen? At some point, you will like essentially return here, then return here, then return here, restore all the registers, and then you will do the IRAT on this tiny five field stack, right? And that will drop you back into user level. This is where you came from. This is how the context switch works. You start at user level with a timer interrupt. It pushes you into the kernel. You do a switch into the scheduler. The scheduler saves your context on the global list of all processes, picks a different process to run, switches into that process. This process is a stack. So you start returning from that stack. And at some point you I wrap into the user level of that new process and you switch the address space. Remember this, inside the scheduler, there was a function which switches the address space, right? Okay, that's essentially what lands you on the user level, right? Is this clear again? This is just the code which essentially, remember, we call the trap function from inside the old traps. The, we, we will return here, the allocate for values, which we allocated on the stack, not for values, for bytes. It's essentially this argument. And we start essentially returning from the interrupt. We will pop all general registers, essentially restoring them, restore the stack segments, erase two four byte values, which we pushed on the, st on the stack, drop number and the error code, and we will do the IRAT instruction, right? And we are exactly at this point when we are doing IRAT, it will essentially land us back in user level, right? That's the whole context which pass through the kernel from user level of one process into the scheduler, into another process in the kernel, and then into the user level of that process, right? Okay. Let me stop here because we magically reached the end of this lecture. Uh, Tell me, is it clear how the context switch works? And meanwhile, I will open this thing to make sure that I will do yet another drawing for you to make sure that we can actually talk about it. You guys good? We still have a couple of minutes so I can do yet another better drawing here. Yet another, like from the very, from the very beginning of how we started running the system, we put it on this CPU, right? We put it into main. Remember, for main, we had a kernel stack, right? Right? This main function itself runs for a little bit, right? Let's imagine it runs down here. At some point, enters MP enter. MP enter enters the scheduler, right? This for loop, which essentially looks at the table of all processes in a system. When I say a table, it's just an array, right? Each entry in this array is a proc data structure, right? Each proc data structure has a context field. This context field is pointing to the kernel stack of this process, right? K stack. And at the very end of this stack, there will be instruction pointer and a stack pointer, ESP, which will point to the user instruction, which was executing, and to the user stack, which we have to use when we exit into the user level. Let me switch here. This is ring three. Sorry, this is ring three. And this is ring zero, right? I agree with this. And so from inside this loop, we do a switch function, which is actually what switch is doing. It takes two arguments. One argument is that there is a special CPU data structure. So there is an array of CPUs. Each entry of this is a CPU. And inside this data structure, there is a scheduler field, right? 
And essentially what we're doing is that this field, essentially when all the arguments, when switch pushes the last arguments on this kernel stack, sorry, on this kernel stack on which we're running, right? So this kernel stack is already kind of half full and we add additional fields like the last, this is the last goalie save registers. Right? So we essentially update this field, well, this one, to point right here, right? So essentially the pointer, which we're passing into the switch function is the pointer which points straight to that field, right? And the second pointer, which we pass to the switch function is the pointer which points to the very top of this kernel stack, right? Right? And essentially the switch, which essentially at some point, the ESP, the ESP register is just getting switched from one stack, essentially this one, gets switched to point to this new stack of the process we're switching to, I agree, right? And this is the core switch function. So core switch at some low level, it just switches the ESP register from one stack to another, right? right? And then we essentially just start popping the registers, right? So we were pushing them here, push, push, push. Now we start popping them. But since we switch the stack, the pops are coming from this stack. Agree with this? So essentially this is how it works. And then this process essentially continues returning from switch using the chain of return addresses, like everything what was, like there will be a chain of return addresses here, right? And then essentially it will do an IRAD and this instruction pointer will be restored to this location in user level, you start running in user level and you will be using this user level stack over here, right? So relatively simple, but at some point it makes your two-dimensional world three-dimensional, right? Let me just show you how. So effectively what happens is you kind of like, you boot it into the kernel, right? And let me just keep drawing instructions of the kernel. Then the kernel decided to switch and switched, right? And you started running in some user process. Maybe it was blue, right? So you said, okay, I will be running in this blue. Then the timer interrupt arrives and it forces you back into the kernel, timer. The timer interrupt says, okay, times to yield, right? This is the yield function. Yield function essentially lands you back on the scheduler. Yield function essentially, like we execute for a little bit inside yield, but it does the switch, right? Switch switches back into the scheduler. So this is the scheduler. This is like kernel part of the process. This is essentially the time when the process P1 is running, right? We switched back into the scheduler. Again, this is the scheduler running. The scheduler picks some other process and switches into it, right? And it doesn't switch directly at the user level. So there will be a kernel part here and then it will do IRAD and then it will start running at user, right? Agree with this? And so the same will happen here. So there will be some kernel part first, it will be a little bit of a kernel, then IRAD into user level, right? Of that green process, right? But this, this is effectively, this is where the P2 is running, right? Both in kernel and user, right? And let me use this orange one, this is where the scheduler is running. So this is the scheduler. This is again the scheduler. You agree with this? Okay, any other questions? We're one minute over, so we should drop out, but hopefully it was clear. Okay, then good. Uh, yeah, I'll see you on Wednesday.
it's a little tough to hold the lecture on Wednesday, but let's try at least. Maybe we'll cancel it, but I don't know. We'll see. We don't have that much time. There is still a lot to finish in this class. So thank you. I'll see you then later this week. And some of you maybe tonight in the architecture class.